Who would you say, if I were to tell you, pick out your wild card teams, which wild card teams are you picking coast to coast this year? I got a number of them here, and I don't think there's anywhere else to start but Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I don't know how you look around the country and say there is a bigger wild card, by the very definition of what wild card is, could be great, could crash and burn, than the LSU Tigers. The Vegas over-under win total for LSU this year is 8.5. It's either 8 or 8.5, depending on where you look. But if you talk to LSU folks, you could find a lot of them. I'm not talking about delusional types. I'm talking about legitimate, dialed-in, logic-based, rationale-type fans who could paint a picture where LSU wins 11 games this year. You could also find what you would classify as the LSU hater, Really, it could just be a realist who has a negative perception of LSU, and they could convince you five wins, six wins max. Both of these exist in the prediction world about the 2021 LSU team. It's talent versus team. That's what it's all about with LSU this year. That's what it was about last year. When they got run out of their own building by Mississippi State in week one, I sat right at this desk, and I said, there was only one football team yesterday. Sure enough, there was a collection of talent on the field for LSU. It didn't resemble a team. Whatever that cohesiveness is, whatever that intangible is, sort of the, the um, oh man, Colin, what's the, you know what, I've never laid brick before and it's embarrassing because I tried to go down that road. Listen, the stuff that holds the bricks together, the mortar, it's not mortar, is it? Anyway, they didn't have that. They didn't have that gel, that cohesiveness. Will they have it this year? Because here's the assumption that's being made. For anyone who wants to paint a rosy picture about how good LSU will be this year, you are assuming that that whole team dynamic just comes into place this year that didn't last year. And if it does, no one questions the talent. You look at LSU's roster, the team versus talent aspect, no one questions the second part of that. No one ever questions the talent roster. It's the team aspect. Here's the good news about this. We're going to know early on. We will watch them take the field early in the season against UCLA. I mean, that should be a competitive game. And any of this stuff that you may have lingering as doubt in the back of your mind about LSU, you'll either be vindicated or it'll be totally vanished and you'll look at LSU and go, okay, game on. They're going to be a legitimate contender this year. So LSU is the first one. How about one in the Pac-12? Arizona State, a lot to like about them. They got a ton of experience, namely at the quarterback position with Jaden Daniels. And here's what I like about them. They haven't proven anything. They had a really weird la year last year, as did a lot of teams. So they've got talent, ton of returning experience, ton of proven guys, too. Uh, they have got really good pieces at running back, wide receiver. I hope is better this year. They expect it to be better this year. But I'll tell you one thing that I don't think you realize unless you dive into Arizona State, and that is when you look at their offensive line and you look at their running back position, they don't have to live and die by the 30-yard pass. They really don't. They could play a different brand of football than maybe you expect when you turn on an Arizona State game, and I think they could win. This team could make the college football playoff this year. This team could lose four or five games this year. That is the definition of a wild card. But I'll tell you what I really love about them. They didn't worry when they hired Herm Edwards about what anyone else was going to say. Because a lot of people had a lot to say when they hired Herm Edwards. Well, they stuck behind their conviction, and they hired him. And then Herm Edwards did his part and brought in a really good staff out there. They've had a vision. They've never strayed away from it. And now they've put together a really good product. And it could be one of those delayed gratification situations we've talked about with other teams where, for all we know, the pieces and the dynamics were in place last year. It got the rug pulled out from under it. And maybe this year is where a lot of that is validated. Arizona State's the wild card team in the Pac-12. I think it's Minnesota when you go to the Big Ten. I had trouble here because I wanted to go a few different ways. I can't in good conscience, say that Wisconsin is that team because Wisconsin's on everyone's radar, and I don't think there's a lot of variance with them. In other words, I couldn't see Wisconsin going 7-5. I could see it with Minnesota. I could also see Minnesota popping. Minnesota's a really dangerous team this year. And on a scale of, you know, 1 to 10, when it comes to the misleading scale from 2020, I think 2020 was really like a 9.5 misleading for Minnesota. They had a couple of games postponed. I think they played one game, Colin, we talked about this, with like 33 starters out, or 33, it's kind of hard to have 33 starters out, 33 guys out. So I don't really know what to make of last year, but what I do know is, for argument's sake, this is what makes a wild card team, it could be more of the same this year, or it could be that last year is by no means an indication of what this team is this year. They have got Tanner Morgan at quarterback, so they have experience there. 
Uh, they have got veteran pieces, at running back veteran pieces at wide receiver. Uh, they got a great big giant chip on their shoulder as a program right now because a lot of people are rubbed the wrong way with how P.J. Fleck carries himself up there. Uh, to his credit, he doesn't care. Uh, but a lot of people are rubbed the wrong way. You know, all those cliches, they get tired of it. And so what I'm saying to you is if you got an opportunity to hang an extra 7 or 10 on Minnesota, you take liberty with it. Kind of the way they do it with Georgia Tech in the ACC. They'll take a little bit of a liberty with Georgia Tech. Um, it's your job to stop them, obviously. But how will they handle the Ohio State game? That's the big question for Minnesota. Because if you look at their schedule, they open with the Buckeyes at home. They're going to be about a two-touchdown underdog in that game. If they win it, totally different discussion. But even if they lose it, let's say even if they lose it in blowout fashion, they've got a winnable stretch after that. You can afford to lose to Ohio State. You can't afford to lose three times to the same team. So is there a lot of residue coming off that Ohio State game? Or do they lose, lick their wounds, use it as a building block, and then emerge in the middle part of the season when they'll be on your radar again uh, playing another kind of national spotlight game and look totally different? So that's the wild card nature of Minnesota. All right. Now, I talked about this a little bit the other night, but I wanted to save it because I wanted to push it to Thursday. The Ole Miss Rebels, I would say, very much define what a wild card team is for 2021. Some of these other programs, they have a ceiling on them that even at their very best, you just wonder what kind of firepower is there. Even with Arizona State, I would wonder until proven otherwise, what kind of firepower is there. Ole Miss is the definition of the wild card team. You want to know how serious to take Ole Miss? Here's, what you, here's all you have to do. If you want to know how seriously to take Ole Miss, just walk around the SEC and look at the expression on someone's face when you say, you're playing Ole Miss this week. It's not fun. It's not something people down here look forward to. I don't care if they're favored. Alabama was favored against them last year. You think that that was enjoyable for Nick Saban to say, well, yeah, we won. I mean, they hung half a hundred on us. We did win, though. That's the name of the game at the end of the day. Ole Miss terrifies people. Now, last year, you understood, as is the classic phrase around here, they couldn't stop molasses in December. So you knew you could just keep scoring on them, and eventually they turned the ball over and you'd get out of there with a whim. So they tried to address that this year. Uh, it could fail. And if it fails, then their ceiling will be well below SEC West contender caliber. But let's say a lot of these cats on this defensive roster, they tried to overturn wholesale over the offseason, <clears throat> which is a term they use, but we don't use. Let's say some of that works. Let's say some of it starts to kind of click when you're trying to turn that engine over and it finally turns over and the car cranks in the middle of winter. Let's say that happens for Ole Miss. You could make the argument, as I said the other night, that Matt Corral is the best quarterback in the SEC entering the season. You could make that argument. You've got Lane Kiffin in year two there. You know what to expect offensively from them. You don't need to know the names. don't need to know anything like that. Uh, you can rest assured they're going to be, you know, a certain level offensively. If they have any kind of pushback, if they have any kind of cohesion, if a lot of those or just a, a fraction of those young guys start to develop a little bit ahead of schedule and they're going to absolutely count on them to, Ole Miss could be very much a contender because they – are going to probably start 3-0. and They play Louisville in week one. If they get through that when they'll be a touchdown favorite, they will go 3-0 and into that Alabama game. And after the Bama game, their next two most losable games, their two toughest games remaining, are both at home. They are Texas A&M and their LSU. I don't think that's in order. Uh, Ole Miss could be there. I mean, they could be in a conversation towards the end of the year that no one expects them to be in when you go to SEC Media Day or you open the season. And in the Big 12, I think it's TCU. TCU is a team we've touched on just a little bit around here, but talk about them a little bit deeper. You realize they had the best rushing offense in the Big 12 last year? I don't think many people do. Um, so if you've forgotten that or you never knew that, I'm going to tell you because a lot of those pieces return. But it shouldn't be the case at TCU that you have to count on the ground game because the passing game's just not there. Max Duggan should absolutely be a quarterback you can lean on. Their wide receiver unit, and it's spearheaded by a, a stud there this year, that absolutely should be a passing game you can lean on. Offensive line failed them horribly last year. If they get even marginal improvement from that unit, this should be an offense that's able to surprise people this year. And if that happens, far be it for me to ever predict that defense is what's going to be holding TCU back. I know they got some questions at linebacker. I think they'll solve them. Let me just say that. And so their first four games... If you, if you start to buy into TCU a little bit, their first four games, 
Duquesne, I've always called him Duquesne. It's going to be a W to start the year. Then they play Cal. Then they play SMU. Then they play Texas. You notice I didn't say they go to any of them. They got four home games to start off with. They eventually go to Oklahoma. They eventually go to Iowa State. But that's on end of the year. We'll know what they are by then. So those are the wild card teams that I see in college football this year. LSU, Arizona State, Minnesota, Ole Miss, TCU. One of these teams, maybe a couple of them, at least one of them, is going to be in the playoff mix come season's end. A couple of other ones are going to be just total tire fires. And we will look at this segment and say that we were both dead on the money and off horribly. That's the nature of the wild card segment.